Hello and welcome to a special episode of the Plus Three Podcast. This week's episode is going to be a little different than usual, in that we're bringing you a recording of a talk titled Right Wing Psychedelia that doctors Brian Pace and Nishay Devineau were invited to give for the University of Wisconsin-Madison's Transdisciplinary Center for Research in Psychoactive Substances in the School of Pharmacy. If you caught our recent episodes with ThoughtSlime, where we unpacked a whole bunch of Jordan Peterson's psychedelic takes, this talk will show some of the wider ecosystem that Peterson fits into. And if you didn't catch those episodes, go check them out after you listen to this. There's some truly surprising connections between the right-wing thought leader and the so-called psychedelic renaissance. And as a quick reminder, Symposia is a volunteer-run, nonprofit, and labor of love. If you appreciate what we do, please consider supporting us at patreon.com slash symposia or symposia.com slash donate. Tell your friends about us or leave us a rating on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to this podcast as it helps others find the show. With that said, as a lead-in to this episode, Pace and Nache write, This presentation highlights the numerous contemporary and historical cases where the use of psychedelics failed to reduce authoritarian tendencies in users, or even facilitated the adoption of authoritarian views. We demonstrate that psychedelics can catalyze change in political or religious belief, but not in a consistent direction. Instead, We propose that many transformative experiences, including those induced by psychedelics, can challenge and radically shift a person's worldview, and that extra-pharmacological factors influence the character of change in ideology or political belief. Take it away, Pace and Nache. Thank you for that great introduction and for the University of Wisconsin-Madison for hosting us. I also want to add that we are both affiliate scholars as a part of the newly founded Center for Psychedelic Drug Research and Education at The Ohio State University. You want to say something? Oh, just that this is, a, as we've mentioned, a, a small segment of a very broad research program that both, of I, both Paige and I have been involved in for many years. So I've been working publicly in the field since 2010 and for a very long time on your part as well. We've been around since before the influx of capital in the space and have been kind of tracking the shifting discourses as money has started to influence the sorts of ideas that are circulating. Yeah, on that note, I've taught about a half a dozen courses on cannabis. And so, you know, we have a model for the corporatization of previously scheduled drugs, which is ongoing. And we expect to see that model refined as it moves into the psychedelic space. That's that's not the um, entirety of this talk. Obviously, this talk deals with issues of ideology and, and politics. I want to sort of provide a, a brief uh, disclaimer or content warning or whatever you want to call it. What you're looking at here is not an image that we made up, you know, for the purposes of this talk. This is LSD blotter that um, presumably was used and circulated with a politician and a swastika in the middle of it. There are several other right-wing psychedelic memes that are interspersed throughout this talk. They were either sent to us or found in the wild. I just wanted to emphasize that we're not you know, cooking things up. We're, we're pointing to that which is happening. And so, there will be as well anti- some reference to anti-trans and other forms of hate speech. So just be forewarned in advance. Yes. So this is a great opportunity for us in that, you know, we had to actually put together a talk for a paper that we were in, invited um, by Frontier Psychology in a special issue on psychedelics and sociality to write on something we had pre- previously independently written about issues of ideology and its intersection with with psychedelics, ideas of hierarchical orientation um, and consciousness expansion or exploration. This paper was published last fall and just to toot our own horns for one second, has gotten significant engagement in that according to the Frontiers metrics has been viewed more than 96% of all other Frontiers articles published by that outlet. So 
clearly something about this topic has got some some broad appeal. There's a lot of eyes on psychedelics, as, as I think we're all aware. There's this thing called the psychedelic renaissance going on, which um, a part of that is the process of mainstreaming psychedelic culture and use and experiments and, and, and science. Just to give an idea of what we'll be talking about here, we'll just sort of outline the reasons for this work and go through some basic terms just so that we're all on the same page. In discussing earlier iterations and components of this work, I think we encountered that there is a lack of a common lexicon, and so we wanted to make sure that everybody understands that we're using certain terms in a particular way, and that those ways are backed up by the historical and, and peer-reviewed definitions of what those are. We've got section, and then we just sort of borrowed um, the section titles from the paper. So just to give an idea of what is coming. So by way of introduction, there was uh, work published in the peer in, that was peer-reviewed in scientific literature about psychedelics and shifts in political perspective, personality traits, first published by Noor and colleagues in 2017, a, a respectable sur survey sample. So, you know, shy of a thousand people were included in this work. And there was a follow-up related study by Taylor Lyons and Robin Carhart Harris that actually used the same metrics. So these are comparable in the sense that their methodology was identical as far as we can tell from, from, these, from the reported data. So they asked a, a one item questionnaire about people's political orientation coupled with their lifetime experience with psychedelics in the Noor et al paper. And then in the Lyons and Carhart Harris paper, in what you can see is a much smaller study sample. This was as a, an adjunct survey, part of clinical trials in psilocybin for the treatment of depression. So just to be clear, because that was a controlled st study, only seven people in the Lyons and Carhart Harris paper got psilocybin. And they were asked this one item questionnaire as well as a five item question about the degree to which they agreed with various statements that were used to assess their um, you know, quantitative relationship on a scale of libertarianism and authoritarianism. In the, um, whereas the Noor et al was a naturalistic study asking people who either had or had not had experiences with classical psychedelics about their political orientations and comparing those groups. With the Lyons, Lyons and Carhart Harris, the, the questionnaire was administered before psilocybin was given as a, a part of treatment for depression and then after. And generally speaking, both of these papers had complementary and reinforcing results, which was that they found lower rates of authoritarianism in those who were psychedelic experienced. And so quite a bit of press was devoted to these two papers, Newsweek asked, can psychedelics stop oppression? Big Think asked more directly, can magic mushrooms help fight fascism? And you can see from the, the dates of those articles, well, it's small, but it says 2018. So these news pieces were circulating right around the time that a lot of money started coming into this space and was being used as a justification in many cases for rapid expansion of, of psychedelic medicine. I would also point out that, you know, the timing of this, these news stories was also concurrent with large events that we will touch on at some point, like the Unite the Right rally. And all of this occurred in the context of the Trump era, where in the United States and global context, there was concern about a particular kind of right-wing authoritarianism. I want to be clear that while... Yes, of course, left wing and other forms of authoritarianism exist. We focused this paper on right wing psychedelia for a number of reasons, mostly in terms of an intervention in a media and research discourse that conflated these results with some other papers that we'll get into later with an idea that psychedelics will, generally speaking, result in more progressive people once they've become experienced with them. The first work 
engaging um, with this discourse was on symposia. I, I wrote some sort of the kernel of putting together counterfactuals to this idea that somehow psychedelics are an antidote to authoritarianism. And that was, as you can see, called Lucy in the Sky with Nazis, Psychedelics, and the Right Wing. This this did get a lot of engagement, given that it was published online, engaging with the peer-reviewed research, but not in a peer-reviewed format. As evidence to my claim that my uh, writing was, was had, had some effect, the Mind Foundation's Eric uh, Lonergan wrote, wrote a piece that actually engaged with a number of related pieces that followed and um, some other work in which... As far as we can tell, Eric Lonergan coined the term political pluripotency. And so the idea being that I think we share, which is why we included it in the title of this work, that psychedelics can precipitate shifts and strengthen one's beliefs around ideology, but not in any particular way. For those of you who aren't aware of where that term comes from, pluripotency is a biological term for cells that are differentiating into any different cell type over their developmental life. So the idea is that any direction is so, so that we're on this, the same page. You know, ideology is a system of belief about, you know, about the world, political theories, policies, in some ways, looking at philosophical questions as well, like age-old ones like how shall we live. Broadly, over time, we can see major divides uh, between those supporting some form of aristocracy or monarchy and more democratic forms of governance, whether that be at a community level or in a representative um, level that we have in the United States. This is further drawn out into basic philosophical divides on the, the use and legitimacy of social hierarchies or the advisability of social equality in various aspects of life and society. We're familiar with feudalism, the idea that kings were divinely ordained to uh, exercise unquestioned rights and that you know, people were subject to that. Left and right as terms have historical meaning. They refer to the period in the French National Assembly in 1789, where they literally referred to where various um, warring factions in the revolutionary era, some supporting the monarchy and referred to as the party of order, sat on the right. And those who sat on the left supported revolution. They were the party of the movement. So that is how they have been characterized. Liberalism historically is a counterpoint to feudalism. It, it challenged that the only sovereign, the only enfranchised individual was getting that power from, from God. And generally speaking, for those of you aware of your, your history, this, is, this was at the time considered to be mostly propertied white men. And this continued for, for some time. I did a quick Google search and I think the last people to be enfranchised voting in the United States were indigenous peoples in the, in like, by like 1965. Uh, so Took a long time. Market, liberal, market liberalism is the ideology shared by, in the American terms, of both liberals and conservatives. So we can think about liberalism with a capital L and liberalism as a sub wing of um, the basal ideology of capitalism uh, that we talk about when we talk about, for instance, Democrats and Republicans. Um, both of them are capital L liberals in their support for private ownership and um, control over the economy. We also have libertarians, um, which is a term that in the United States context is actually somewhat confused. In the international sense, libertarianism is a, a, a synonym for socialism, and that's the historically accurate term. We can point to when and when proponents of a right-wing libertarianism, uh, la laissez-faire capitalist types, actively co-opted the term. So getting on to where we have focused um, a lot of our attention in this paper, generally speaking, there are ideologies that are right-wing authoritarian. And, but I do want to emphasize that you know, when we're talking about the party of order, we're talking about the ideologies of capitalism, private ownership of the economy, generally speaking, 
internationally, these are, these are considered right-wing movements. Do you want to talk more about some of this? Uh, can... Okay, so social dominance orientation is generally like a psych psychological orientation and comfort with, with hierarchy. There are, there are people who you can measurably show that this is what makes them comfortable. This is what they think is, is right. And this includes what we generally refer to as conservatives or traditionalists who value certain agrarian and patriarchal values. This can be further refined into ultra nationalism, where the nation state is held above all others. In the American context, we call this American exceptionalism. Ethno nationalism is where the state and its legitimacy is conflated with a particular ethnicity. This can, has, or inevitably does lead to violence because no geographical area is 100% ethnically heterogeneous or homogeneous. Which leads us to fascism, which has been variously described, but depends on the persecution of outgroups and in, in many ways is an ideology of power and uh, hierarchy in its purest and most pragmatic sense. And Nazism adds a hyper-racialized component to that in that Nazism is more like, is more properly considered as an umbre under the umbrella of fascism internationally. And then of course, neither of these ideologies went away. We have neo-Nazi and neo-fascist movements organizing internationally today. So we quote in the paper uh, the work of Boone, who points out that aristocrats, bankers, German right wing, right wing ex-military men, not to mention the CIA and the Nazis from the 1930s to the 1960s, is a little acknowledged fact that one of the principal sources of interest in psychedelics aside from interest in researchers working on specific therapeutic uses, was people of conservative or right-wing orientation. LSD was distributed through a somewhat aristocratic network of psychologists and well-connected individuals. But while this may be known by you know, folks that pay attention to psychedelic history, other traditions are less explored. And I think I would advocate that reckoning with the legacy of institutional experimentation with psychedelics is timely as some of the same sorts of institutions delve back into psychedelic research. The reality is, is that the lineage of MK Ultra, a program of involuntary and unethical human experimentation with the object of gaining control over people's will has its roots um, with experimentation by the Axis, both in by the Japanese empire and by the Nazis. So this is Kurt Plotner. He was a Nazi physician, a member of the SS. He worked at Dachau in Department R. They did experimentation on malaria, infecting individuals and watching the progression of the disease. They were also looking for a truth serum. This was the inspiration for the MK Ultra search for a truth serum, um, which is part of that work. But also, they did work with mescaline and Jews interned in the camps. And we know that Kurt Plotner himself and thousands of other Nazi and Japanese imperial technicians and scientists were imported into the United States and put to work on things like the space program. And also, in the case of Kurt Plotner, kept in like West Germany because they were too, too toxic to be brought into the United States. So this is a picture of a, a German Wehrmacht captain. His name is Ernst Jünger. He's a, a literary figure, often described as complicated. He is also the originator pointer of the term psychonaut. In his time in occupied France, he served as a uh, Nazi censor. And he was a close personal friend of Albert Hoffman. And when Albert Hoffman wanted someone to share his experiences with, both um, from a personal, we might call integrative perspective today, but also from a literal perspective. These two men 
shared LSD sessions together. Ernst Jünger wrote about his experiences with drugs and was admired and such by Albert Hoffman that he devoted an entire chapter to LSD, My Problem Child, uh, entitled The Radiance of Jünger. Jumping to the present, open, self-identified fascists and neo-Nazis organized in the Unite the Right um, rally in Charlottesville, Virginia. This, for those of you who don't remember exactly, this was the Tiki Torch khaki polo march where Heather Heyer, a anti-fascist protester, was killed in a intentional vehicular assault. A lot of the Unite the Right's goals were to organize online fascists and bring them together IRL, as they say. It was, it, some of it was organized on uh, anonymous Chan boards like 4chan and 8chan, later 8kun, but also had support from the Daily Stormer, the Proud Boys, more extreme groups like Adam Waffen. Adam Waffen is so named because it is their goal to obtain a dirty bomb to use against their enemies. Not only were these organizations affiliated in one way or another with the Unite the Right rally and the violence that occurred there, each of these organizations have members or leaders and both who have documented and discussed their own experiences with psychedelics and what it meant specifically with regard to their hierarchical ideology. In the case of the Proud Boys, Gavin McGinnis, who was a co-founder of Vice Magazine, literally has given advice to his mostly young male audience on how to weather a bad trip. And so these, these people are aware um, that this is a common uh, occurrence in their communities. This is some headline that happened after the publication of Right Wing Psychedelia. Yes, of course. An Anchorage man's magic mushrooms sales led authorities to swastika stickers charges say. I believe his Instagram handle was Frosty Fungi and he was growing mushrooms and selling them, which led to a sting operation. It was only then that police connected him to a spate of swastika propaganda around Anchorage. If you read the paper, you can see where we have mined the Stormfront chat archives for discussion, favor, even knowledgeable of the current research around psychedelics by posters who openly identify themselves as fascists and neo-Nazis. Um, Stormfront, by the way, is the oldest hate site on the web. The Daily Stormer is a newer one whose founder, Andrew Anglin, has a documented history with a number of psychedelic and hallucinogenic drugs. So after his experimentation with psychedelics, he, he started one of these organizations. And the same is actually true for Gavin McGinnis. Which brings us to the Capitol riots, the insurrection. These individuals were iconic. We see Jacob Chansley or Yellowstone Wolf, AKA the Q Shaman. And this is the second symposia piece, the subject, right? This was the second symposia piece that I wrote. This, this came out the day after the insurrection and, and focused on Jacob Chansley or Jake and Jelly as he was known at the time. Frankly, because I had a hunch that the guy wearing face paint and horns shirtless covered in uh, pagan tattoos might have experience with psychedelics. I found... Can tell the story of the... Yeah, you know, in the, in the events, you know, a lot of people who attended the riot, the, the capital riots thought that they would be victorious, that they would um, overturn the election. And when that didn't happen, many of these people realized that they had just documented their own case against them. And so we now know that many of them attempted to erase their online footprint. The same was the case of the Q Shaman or Angeli. But suspecting that this might be happening early that morning, I found his Facebook post and watched on my phone as it, as it was deleted from the web, which I was able to record. On Angeli's Facebook page, he was advertising himself as a psychedelic guru 
shaman consultant. And for just $44.44, he could counsel you on your own plant medicine journey and how to deal with your identity as a starseed at Starseed Academy. Much of this is strongly and firmly in the vein of conspirituality, the merger between conspiratorial beliefs such as those held by Chansley and, and those of spirituality and the new age. Along with Chans- Chansley and next to him in the yellow is William Watkins or Watson. And both of these individuals I, I later um, discovered were deeply entrenched in psychedelic use. And, and strangely enough, the tattoos on Watson's hand were what alerted me to his association and chose led me to dig a little bit more into his history. And, and on the right, he was being criticized because on his right hand, there's a tattoo that if you squint might look like a sickle and hammer. He was accused of being a secret Antifa crisis actor, which might be believable with his bushy hair and, and beard. But if you look at his left hand, there's a quite colorful tattoo which looked familiar. This is the emblem of a dark web website called Pushing Taboo, run by Gamma, Gamma Goblin, uh, the arguably one of the largest and most prolific LSD distributors on the web. Watson was actually out on bail for uh, $106,000 odd dollars for possession of, I think, something, something like 40,000 hits of LSD, like a, a very large amount. Uh, if, you, if you want to know what, what it is exactly, that, that article was written up as turn off your, relax, turn off your mind and float right wing. The Q conspiracy has its own psychedelic imagery and themes. This is the hashtag follow the right white rabbit, uh, which has its own psychedelic connotations. But more directly, part of this hashtag and the constellation of conspiracies involved in the Q world is a version of the Jewish anti-Semitic blood libel conspiracy where Jews or the manipulators of the world as it's postulated are uh, bathing in the blood or eating children of the, of the believers. In this case, harvesting a, adrenochrome from the uh, pineal glands of children to inject into their veins. This is a, a mildly psychoactive substance with a bit of a a history, but it's not, it's really not in wide use. So one of the subjects that we explore in the paper is that a lot of the historical barriers to more elements of the far right using psychedelics are actually shifting. So there's increasingly examples of white supremacist friendly models for and lineages of psychedelic use so whereas we point out in the paper, something like, you know, an, an indigenous jungle blend of ayahuasca is not necessarily something that a white supremacist is going to get behind. There's examples like this film that just came out, The Northman, that has, we haven't seen it yet, but we were reading about how there is a, a psychedelic initiation. initiation that was seen in the film and already media have explored the fact that while the filmmakers themselves are not white supremacists and were, they felt trying to be careful not to make this film a white supremacist film, nonetheless, media outlets have been covering the fact that white supremacists are hijacking the film and people are, are hailing the Nordic lore that's already popular with alt-right groups and ideas about pure masculinity. So these are examples that white supremacists can get behind and kind of encourage future right-wing psychedelic use. And we want to stress that this love in particular for, say, the Northmen, for example, is not in spite of a scene of psychedelic initiation, but perhaps in part, at least, because we point to an example of the base, uh, a white nationalist group that was active at the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville. They were arrested on weapons charges and found to be attempting to manufacture through extraction, most likely dimethyltryptamine. But an infiltrator, or not, excuse me, not an infiltrator, a member of this group wrote a memoir that was obtained by Vice Magazine in which they describe a a pagan ritual that was 
uh, explicitly intended for group bonding that involved animal sacrifice. So, quote, closer to midnight, we approached the hallowed ground on which the ceremony would be held. We killed and skinned the sheep in what I did and still do consider to be a respectful manner, he writes. Then drank a sip of his blood from a cup around the dim glow of our torches as a ritual, bringing us closer together as brothers. Some of us also took LSD to celebrate the holiday and the event which had taken place. As you can see, they're pictured with the beheaded animal's skull, which became something of a meme in their telegram group. Which brings us to psychedelics themselves and what it is that we know that they do. One of the things that psychedelics facilitate subjectively is that they enhance meaning making. And this is actually something that those on the right are quite competent in doing. They refer to it as meme magic. Many of you are now aware that the OK symbol was intentionally associated with white pride as a, uh, a way of both making fools of those who believed this, but also as a secret symbol that those flashing it could use to uh, identify themselves. So we point to the, we point to the uh, radicalization literature that shows that one of the first steps on uh, the path towards radicaliza radicalization is a cognitive opening, a destabilizing event that causes a person to doubt their worldview. Basically, psych psychedelics are suggestion-enhancing drugs. They can cause these kinds of windows for worldview shift. Something that Naomi Klein pointed to, specifically using the example of shock therapy and MK Ultra, saying that in one of his most influential essays, Milton Friedman articulated contemporary capitalism's core tactical nostrum, what I've come to understand as the shock doctrine. He observed that only a crisis actual or perceived produces real change. Yeah. Could you... Oh, yeah. So, so we're going to talk a little bit about deep ecology and eco-fascism, the sort of environmental wing of the fascist movement. And, and Nishé is going to go into some of the, Dr. Dever is going to go into some of the, the work associated with it. Just as sort of a, a cultural example, the, hand, the Handmaid's Tale, Tale show talks about Gilead, which uh, is an example of a climate conscious fascist movement. The Volkish movement is another example where we have, you know, people following the footsteps of uh, Hitler uh, in adopting vegetarianism. And so the, the context of this conversation about how environmentalism can turn in fascist directions relates to other literature that's come out. So I, I took a close look at Forsman and Sagioglu's paper here titled Lifetime Experience with Classic Psychedelics Predicts Pro-Environmental Behavior through an increase in nature relatedness, so feeling connected to nature. And their paper was a correlational analysis of almost 1,500 online survey participants. And they focused their questions on 12 headline behaviors that were nested in four areas of everyday environmental concern, including domestic resource consumption, waste behavior, transportation use, and eco-friendly shopping. And in their paper, they, their, their findings correlated with their predictions, which were that psychedelic experience leads to an ecocentric identification with nature or feeling one with the larger natural world, and that that experience of connection with nature leads to pro-environmental behaviors. In citing their, their in, in citing sources to support their hypotheses, I took a look at the citations that they pointed to. The first citation held that conservatives hold negative views about recreational drug use. For now, I'm going to bracket that, but we're going to come back to that at the end. And they also cited a paper by Shulton Stone from 1994 that made the case that right-wing authoritarianism was highly negatively correlated with environmental concern. So they were saying that there's evidence that authoritarianism and environmental concern are not things that overlap. So given that we were familiar with the eco-fascist movements, which use the justification of 
things like climate change or the need to preserve nature with, or they, they justify fascist or other kinds of control over society towards those environmental ends as a counterfactual for this claim. So I looked at the Schultz and Stone paper and reading closer to what they were in their argument, they were saying that even, even back in 1994, at the end of their paper, they said, he found looking at a study of people's views about a power plant and public environmental generally, they found that those things were not correlated with authoritarianism and environmentalism. But they said if you project future trends, and especially looking at the fact that climate change is getting harder and harder to ignore, they predicted in the future, speaking from 1994, that over time, that gulf that they saw was actually going to disappear as more and more people were forced to confront the reality of climate change. So they point to examples, of, or one of the, the, in the literature on, on how climate change is getting worse, it includes increases in extreme weather and climate events, including wildfires, flooding, droughts, storms, heat waves, vector-borne diseases, food, or, food and water insecurity, and property damage. So even in their citation, there was this kind of undermining of the easy association or negative correlation between authoritarianism and concern about nature. So one of the things that I just wanted to touch on briefly in the justification for when people are talking about why it might be that psychedelics lead to um, increased pro-environmental behavior, the literature on deep ecology and, and nature relatedness more generally has come up again and again. So ju just to, as an overview, deep ecology was an environmental philosophy that was founded by two, uh, two philosophers in the 70s and 80s. And it argues that maladaptive environmental behaviors are symptomatic of Western culture's anthropocentric and utilitarian and individualist attitude towards nature. And they argue that any meaningful behavior change needs to address that underlying sense of separation from nature. Because you can moralize with people and say you should recycle, you should do these things. But if you tap into people's innate sense of self-preservation and, oh, the natural world is me, then people are more motivated to, to do things in a sustainable, long-lasting way. So deep ecology historically has ties to, unfortunately, fascism. So although deep ecology by itself is not a fascist philosophy, there are historical precedents and kind of synergies between ecofascism and deep ecology. Ecofascism uh, offers totalitarian solutions like ethnic cleansing, and they believe that finite natural resources means that uh, there's justification for preserving those resources in, the, in, in these cases for white people or other powerful groups because there's not favored groups favorite favorite in groups to be clear there's um, fascism for instance in india today and in such uh, that hindus would be the group favored in such a uh, plan right so just in in the portman and sagio blue paper they talk about the self other overlap as being what seems to be informing for environmental behavior it's also been described elsewhere as allo-inclusive identity or identity that incorporates the other into the sense of self. And they argue that that increases empathic concern through a two-way process of incorporating the other's features into oneself or nature in this case, into oneself and projecting or ascribing one's own characteristics onto the other and in this case, nature. So, but from the eco-fascist side, there's a, a whole bunch of, uh, sub themes related to eco fascism. So that includes eco naturalism or viewing the natural world as a blueprint for the social order, which Jordan Peterson gets into, which we'll go into in a second. Eco organicism, viewing the, the folk or the people as an ecosystem. And then lastly, eco authoritarianism or the need for a strong state to deal with the environmental crises efficiently. We see here Blut and Bowden or blood and soil, which was long uh, a Nazi motto, slogan. And the fascist potential in deep ecology has long been critiqued by eco-feminists who have pointed to eco-philosophers who, although they're talking about everything being interconnected, 
if you look, read closely into what they're saying, there's actually an instrumentalism or like a subtle hierarchy. Like we're all, everything's one. So I have a right to hunt and torture and exploit animals in this case. It's an example of how feelings of interconnection are still compatible with hi hierarchies and unequal power relations. And if you could just want to mention this. Yeah, so the reality of scientific racism, dividing humanity incorrectly into multiple species and subspecies you know, is broadly a, a part of the eugenics tradition. There are those who you know, believe in the, the breeding of intelligence or other desirable traits this movement in the United States has is is part of the ideological basis for what the Nazis enacted in, in a racial nationalist policy. And when interconnection, experiences of interconnection are interpreted as interconnection to hierarchy, suddenly it becomes justified to use metaphors like pruning the branches, you know, mm -hmm. depending on, you know, the, the branches can be disabled people or other other minorities. And it's the, the logic of, oh, I, I'm identifying with the all, so the particular of these specific people don't matter as much. That's what can happen in the eugenics context. To, to be clear, and we make clear in the paper, eugenics is a pseudoscience that has been uh, repudiated by modern population geneticists who've identified only one human species and no discernible racial correlation between intelligence. Briefly yeah, so we're moving on to Jordan Peterson, who's a, a cultural figure on, on the right in conservative circles. He is a, an academic psychologist with many publications, but catapulted himself to fame by sounding the, the alarm, as he would put it, around the Canadian Human Rights Bill C-16, which was an amendment to human rights protection to include trans people as those protected, protected group against which hate crimes legislation could could. Protect. Protect. He claimed that, that this legislation would result in compelled speech that would make him, force him by the government to refer to his students by their preferred pronouns, and that this was a, uh, a steady march towards Mao tactics that would end, end up with people being imprisoned for, for not complying with governmentally compelled speech. But to this, to this day, there's been no arrests for misuse of pronouns in he, Canada, and it was completely mischaracterizing the bill. He's been um, roundly rebuked by legal scholars in Canada. And more recently, in the past few weeks, he's made a kind of pivot towards criticizing a new bill, Bill C-67, which he's characterizing as a critical race theory bill. So a lot of the same kind of hysterics around, you know, government overreaching is now kind of continuing in this new component. But just to the part that I have at the bottom here, from Jordan Peterson's perspective, hierarchy and dominance hierarchy is what holds up all of society and keeps the darkness at bay in society. And so for, from Jordan Peterson's perspective, social justice warriors who are advocating for what he talks about as equality of outcome are threatening the very mechanism in society that kind of shuttles people to the appropriate place in the hierarchy and allows for society to continue. And, and not just in society, he's commonly associated with his metaphor of the lobster having dominant hierarchies. And so he posits that it is in our very genes to be a part of hierarchical relations. So he, he selectively takes metaphors from the natural world and says that his ideology is the natural ideology because you can find one example, but there are lots of other examples they could be drawing on. But this, if I could capture Jordan Peterson's ideology in one picture, I would point to this meme that is referred to as soldiers holding up society, because his perspective is basically like that the people who are, are advocating for trans people or women's equality or racial equality are doing so because the dominance hierarchy is creating the foundations for people to complain and they are kind of acting out of out of turn not realizing how grateful they should be for their place in the hierarchy and in frequently using self-help language to admonish people to uh, set their house not not well in order not clean their room a little bit but perfectly before one criticizes the world and his, his Ur myth is kind of overall myth that he keeps referring to to describe why, you know, things like the trans bill or 
the critical race theory bill should n- not be a thing is he's comparing it to Cain and Abel from the book of Genesis. So in that story, there's one son who does everything right and is able to succeed. And the other one is kind of just embittered by the fact that he's not on top of the status hierarchy and in a rage lashes out against and kills the brother. And so he compares this dynamic to social justice warriors who are seeking to destroy all of existence in the most hyperbolic sense, but due to a sense that they deserve more than their lot actually justifies them. Sort of paraphrase, sh- shaking their fists at God for the, the pain of existence. So the reason we've been talking about Jordan Peterson is that Jordan Peterson recently has made a hard pivot towards psychedelics. He's been interested in psychedelics for a long time, but his, this is a, I'm showing a brief clip from his conversation last year with Roland Griffiths, who is at Johns Hopkins doing research there. And he, Jordan Peterson as an example, shows how these kind of authoritarian leaning ideologies are entirely compatible with psychedelic experiences of interconnection. And it shows that he's broadcasting the benefits of psychedelics to right-wing people through his very substantial platform. He has almost 5 million followers on YouTube. In association again with Roland Griffiths, who to be clear has headed the Johns Hopkins Center for Consciousness and Psychedelic Research and is largely accredited with restarting the Renaissance in psychedelic research. They reveal in this longer conversation that they've been friends for 20 years. As we said earlier, Jordan Peterson was a traditional academic in psychology. So I'm about to show it's a few minute long clips, but just a lot of our research comes from media analysis because a lot of the right wing kind of discourse is happening online. So just to give some in- the ideas that are being shared. There's a sense of the interconnectedness of all people, all things, the unity. Yeah, the meaningful interconnectedness, not just connected, but also that the entire pattern of connection has some transcendent or ultimate significance. What's more important than this, Jordan? I actually can't believe how important this is. And I've been studying the psychedelic literature for 20 years in as deep a manner as I can possibly manage. And every time I think I have some grasp on how important it is, I learn something else and I think, oh, it's way more important than I thought it was. It's of crucial significance. It's of central, it's literally of central significance. It's literally of central significance. Our life is dependent on death. Our cells are constantly dying. And if death isn't regulated properly within us, we get cancer. So the fact of our healthy existence is actually dependent on death itself. The proper amount of death keeps us healthy. That's also true psychologically. You have to let old concepts die. And and they don't like to die. It's it's a painful experience to have the old you die in, in the light of new experience. It's painful enough so that people will resist it. But there's this benevolent death that's a reparative mechanism. When I've allowed my intuitions to extend themselves as far as possible, I think, well, that's, that's true of, of being itself. In the manner that we can't comprehend, death plays a restorative role. And a, a glimpse of that shows you that there's more going on than you think. So that that point he just made a glimpse of that shows you that there's more going on than you think. He's referring back to that Abel and Cain relationship where it's like, you think you have a right to lash out against the order of the cosmos. Who are you to be making those sorts of claims? Get back in line. And the idea is that interconnection can be interconnection to hierarchy. And he naturalizes in the next clip I'm going to show He emphasizes how his view is that the entire world is a nested fractal hierarchy as a way of justifying why that structure exists in society. Did you say last night of the 100,000 most recently printed books, only a thousand have sold more than a million? Yeah, something like that. It's something like that. Power laws all the way down. Yeah, everywhere, everywhere. Power law, that's, you know, a tiny minority of people do all the work, a tiny minority of people get all the benefit. Tiny minority of athletes score all the goals. A tiny minority of men get all the women, etc. A tiny minority of stars have all the mass. A tiny minority of rivers have all the water. A tiny minority of cities have all the people, etc., etc., etc. Everywhere, always, you know. And and we're so clueless in our culture that we blame that on capitalism. It's like, how how does that account for the mass of stars, people? <laughs> 
So this clip is Jordan Peterson on Stefan Molyneux's uh, podcast discussing race and IQ. At the time, I want to be transparent that Stefan Molyneux, what we would call a crypto fascist. He did not openly identify himself with fascist or hard right beliefs. He considered himself a radical right libertarian. He's since much more identified with an open fascist open white nationalist um, view. The conversation that Jordan Peterson and Stefan Molyneux have here is revealing. IQ is a particularly ugly aspect of science because the IQ literature reveals that which no one would want to be the case, mm. which is that there are profound and virtually irremediable differences in people's cognitive performance, and that those differences have a very solid biological and heritable basis. No one wants to hear that. They don't want to hear that it's biological. They don't want to hear that it's heritable. They don't want to hear it's permanent. They don't want to hear that it's irremediable and that it actually has a practical consequence. And no wonder they don't want to hear And, it. and even worse, they don't want to hear that it differs between genders and ethnicities. That is, to me, one of the most painful things that I've ever learned in my life is, is this kind of information. It is one of the great heartbreaks when it comes to the dream of pure egalitarianism. And that is, I think, even harder. It's an even harder pill for people to swallow. Yeah, well, the gender differences in IQ look relatively trivial, but there are differences in ethnicity that don't look trivial. The Ashkenazi Jews, for example, have on average a 15-point advantage over the rest of the Caucasian population, which is sufficient to account for their radical over-representation in positions of authority and influence and, and productivity. You know, and, and I am, to just get me, to just so that it's absolutely clear, I am not saying that's a bad thing. I'm saying there's a real reason for it that no one wants to contend with. So to be clear, this uh, racial hierarchy of IQ that uh, Jordan Peterson is referring to, one can find this trend in the literature. Also, to situate the IQ test itself, it was a test developed by eugenicists to do eugenics better. That said, much of the debate surrounding IQ is centering the entire genetic basis of any differences in this test that have been found and downplaying environmental. For example, poverty can uh, cause a tenfold uh, difference in IQ in, these, in, these, in this literature. But the, the hierarchy that he is referring to that places Ashkenazi Jews at the top is one that is actually used by Nazis to explain their worldview in that intelligent Jews, their cleverness is the reason why they have been able to manipulate the world. And this literature that he's um, nodding to explicitly later in the clip referencing the bell curve places African American or uh, uh, black, black people at the bottom of this hierarchy. So when he's talking about psychedelics, make you realize you're interconnected to everything and that there's more going on than you think. He's also saying that people who are lower in the hierarchy need to just accept their place in that hierarchy. So the other point I wanted to get to is that recently Jordan Peterson has been speaking out in favor of conversion therapy, you know, which, which, which has a dark history in psychedelic therapy. Historically. Um, historically. Yeah. And, and, and in my work in psychedelic bioethics, and also I have collaborated on qualitative research with NYU and Johns Hopkins. There's a lot of literature kind of suggesting that one of the ways that psychedelic assisted psychotherapy might be so effective therapeutically is that it supports, the theory goes, shifting people's sense of self in a direction such as, I no longer identify as being a smoker. And so it's easier for me to quit smoking, kind of getting back to that deep ecology idea that if you identify with nature, it's easier to change behavior. But what happens when conservatives start getting into psychedelic therapy or conversion therapy? What happens if Uyghur Muslims in China are given psychedelic therapy to try to change their sense of self and their connections to their culture? These are topics that we feel like are really important to be aware of and to anticipate as right-wing components of society become more and more invested in psychedelics. So I'll just play this clip. 
know, the issue that you started to become really politically prominent on, which is the, the Bill C-16, the gender issue. Yeah. But I think the fundamental good of humanity relies on basic acknowledgments of biological truth, especially when it comes to gender. In Canada, because they banned conversion therapy, it's now all affirmation therapy. Right, this is this There's is no insane. such thing as affirmation therapy. It's insane. The, the semantic game that was used in order to say, well, conversion therapy, which was at one time using electric shock mm -hmm. to treat homosexuals, yeah. And saying that that's the same thing as you have a gender-confused 12-year-old. Look, I had a 14-year-old kid who was a client of mine. Now this idea is you come to me with an axiomatic claim, whatever it is about your identity, and my job is to rubber stamp it. It's like, that's not, I'm not a therapist then. So this is not only insane, this insistence, the notion that therapists affirm is an anti-truth. And along those lines, recently he's been talking also on Joe Rogan about trans identity as being a form of social contagion. So I'll play this clip. The high trade openness people, they're the ones that are more likely to have green hair and red hair and lots of piercings and lots of tattoos. And they have trouble catalyzing a single identity. And then if you throw in categorical confusion, which is exactly what you're doing when you declare that there's, you know, an endless number of gender identities, then people who are prone to identity dissociation and to psychogenic contagion, you're gonna demolish them. There is an obsession. Abigail Schreier has documented that quite nicely in, in her book, Irreversible Damage. So you think, well, perhaps a few people who are transgender benefited from this new reality, but for everyone who's benefited, and you know, I'd like to see the data just showing how much they actually benefited, and that'll take a long time to accrue. There's a thousand people who've been just demolished by this. So when you follow for imagining listening to Jordan Peterson from his far right audience, he's saying things like psychedelics reveal that the hierarchy is natural in society, that we have to accept that death is sometimes what is necessary to keep things healthy. You combine this with trans and other kinds of views as being a form of social contagion that's trying to disrupt the order of society and suddenly in the so in Nazi Germany there was this like this social cleansing that was advocated so the Jews were portrayed as a kind of cancer Rats, that needed to be German. that needed to be purged to protect society and so we're hearing the same kinds of discourses around Jordan Peterson and he's acknowledging in this next clip that coding things as cancer justifies atrocities. So he's not putting those points together explicitly, but for his far right wing listeners who know that history of coding things as cancer, they can connect the dots and potentially lead towards violent actions. This idea that the planet has too many people on it, there's no sentiment more implicitly genocidal. What do you propose to do about that exactly? Mass abortion, is that your answer? Or should we do something a little more dramatic? It's associated with a deeply rooted existential self-hatred. Humanity is like a cancer on the planet, you know, unchecked growth, just like a cancer, a cancer. It's okay, we know where your heart is located. Because what's, what's the implications for, for a doctrine like that? What do you do with a cancer? Cut it out. Yeah, that's for sure. Poison it or whatever. There's nothing you don't do to a cancer. So you're going to use a metaphor like that? There's too many people on the planet. You're going to use a metaphor like that? And then you're going to also decide that you're virtuous while you're using it because you're on the side of the planet, whatever the hell that means. So he's using metaphors like that. And he's using it in a way that he's saying is going to support the ongoing legacy of Western society. And he's using psychedelics to fit into that narrative. So that's why I wanted to tie those pieces together. And I'm not gonna go into this, I just wanna briefly point to this is because my background, my PhD is in comparative literature. And so one of the kind of things that the humanities have to bring to these conversations is pointing to the ways that Jordan Peterson's ideology, for example, has long time precedence in even Western cultures. So this is a, a poem, an essay on man by Alexander Pope, and it goes into, it's in a footnote in the paper, but he basically mentions how all of reality is this great nested fractal chain of being. And to try to disrupt one piece of that, like by abolishing slavery, is to throw the whole system into chaos. And so everyone's role is exactly where they are. And so the slave should feel proud of their role as slave because it enables the system to function. 
to break the chain, a, a link in the chain is to destroy the chain. So in, in, in our work with looking at the association between conservatives and uh, psychedelics, uh, we came across the first instance that we can find of using the red pill as a metaphor for radical politics on the right, the process of radicalization, taking the red pill, actually maps back to this quote by neo-reaction, dark enlightenment thinker, Mencius Moldbug, or Curtis Yarvin, in which he compares it, his work, as it's like talking about a mild DMT trip. If it wasn't mild, it wasn't DMT, or if it was mild, it wasn't DMT. He says, we know about red pills, many claim to sell them. You can go, for example, to any bookstore and ask the guy behind the counter for some Noam Chomsky. What you'll get is blue pills soaked in red number three. So here is this common place uh, metaphor used on the right all the time. There are subreddits on it. There is a documentary on the manosphere on taking the red pill. Its first usage in this matter directly compared to a potent trip. We want to acknowledge the debt of some of this work to Alan Piper, who explored this in an excellent monograph called um, strange drugs make for strange bedfellows. I do recommend reading it, but in it, he uh, explores a trend that he saw where uh, Inner Traditions, which is a common, which is a, a prominent psychedelic publisher, actually published the works of uh, Julius Avola, who is an occult, an occultist, was an occultist philosopher, Italian, who put, put forth a lot of the ideology that inspired the fascists. And this collection, when he looked at who had actually published it, was Michael Moynihan of the band Blood Axis, an open neo-Nazi in the neo-folk musical tradition. And he had also published the collected works of James Mason, which are a movement Bible on the today, uh, a, a group of writings called Siege, which advocate for accelerationist lone wolf tactics for uh, the destruction of what they considered to be the decadent West for uh, the reinstallation of traditional values. This leads to the most direct psychedelic link in this duo, the mother, or the husband and wife duo that make up Blood Access, Annabelle Lee. Annabelle Lee actually translated one of my favorite books, the Encyclopedia of Psychoactive Plants, and has also done work on translation of Albert Hoffman's writings. So it, there is this trend of very interested and informed open psychedelic Nazis. We want to transition to a term we've used a lot at Symposia called corporadelic and talking about them in the context of a, a right-wing ethos. Corporadelic is adjectives that, that describes manifesting corporate structures and uh, ethos or logic within the context of the psychedelic landscape. It was coined uh, independently by Dr. Catherine McLean, um, who's at Johns Hopkins uh, doing psilocybin research, and former and, and symposia co-founder, Brett Green. Also corporadelia, the world of people, phenomenon, or items associated with corporadelic entities. So what are we talking about here? Well, we could call it the shroom boom. These are all, all of the privately held psychedelic corporations that are identifiable when I made these slides, and also the publicly held, publicly traded psychedelic companies. Uh, many of you may be aware of Compass Pathways, but there are many, many other others of these these groups who have moved into the space. So, and I'm just going to very quickly refer to work that I've done with my co-author Alex Guerin on psychedelic medicalization here. So the corporadelic boom is happening within the context of neoliberal capitalism, which is offering market-based solutions to social problems. And neoliberalism, neoliberalism originated as a theory of political economic practices, but I'm based on the assumption in the words of David Harvey that, quote, human well-being can best be advanced by liberating individual entrepreneurial freedoms and skills within an institutional framework characterized by strong property rights, free markets, and free trade. And as this ideology increasingly came to dominate global commerce, neoliberalism infiltrated the private subjective realm as a hegemonic mode of discourse that, quote, had pervasive effects on ways of thought to the point where it became incorporated into the common sense way that many of us interpret, live in, uh, interpret, live in, and understand the world, and end quote from Harvey. So living under neoliberal capitalism, individuals co continuously have to confront psychological pressures to succeed and persevere as atomized individuals in increasingly precarious social arrangements and jobs, et cetera. So neoliberal advocates for psychedelic medicine or the corporadelic set often conceptualize distress as a neurochemical and behavioral problem to be solved at the level of the individual, and they're offering solutions to that. And so in various ways, this individualization of the social 
conceives of individualist and medic medicalized solutions to challenges posed by authoritarianism and climate change. Because as this book, James Davies uh, recently published, sedated how modern capitalism created our mental health crisis. Um, and James Davies is currently uh, gonna be coming to Ohio State for a conference that we're gonna describe at the very end, which we're getting close to. So, but the idea here is that corporate, corpidelic actors are citing the papers that we put early in the, in the presentation to justify why there has to be this rapid scaling of psychedelic medicine to get into as many bodies and minds as possible, as quickly as possible, even claiming that the future of the planet depends on this kind of psychedelic expansion. But we point to the fact that this is a bit of a bait and switch going on because it's actually, if you look at authoritarianism and climate change, there's a lot of evidence connecting those movements to the rise of inequality fostered by capitalism. And so psychedelic capitalism here is purporting to offer solutions to something that systemically capitalism is actually furthering. It's also a great marketing pitch, but we point to Thai Life Sciences, which is the largest psychedelic investor in the space and uh, a kind of chemical wellness that we might liken to the corporate wellness programs and meditation retreats that your work might offer you. CEO Christian Angermeyer has posited that their company portfolio has cures for ending the mental health crisis because, quote, we are building a world um, that is bad for our brain. And when he says we are building that world as somebody who has uh, significant resources to bear and sits on the advisory board of His Excellency um, Paul Kagame, the authoritarian president of Rwanda, he, he has significant influence to build that world. It should be noted that Paul Kagame is known internationally as an authoritarian strongman who has extensively, his human rights abuses have been uh, documented by Human Rights Watch, and that authoritarian regimes effectively require human rights abuses to function. So we point to how a lot of these narratives around um, elite consciousness expansion have been put on the table by, by some uh, aspects of, of psychedelic advocates. Tim Ferriss is a sort of a self-help guru, and he was quoted saying, the billionaires I know almost without exception use hallucinogens on a regular basis. In the paper, we document many of the billionaires who are on record about their own psychedelic use or have been documented elsewhere as having used them including currently the, the world's richest uh, man, Elon Musk, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, uh, Minecraft founder, Notch Peer Pearson, who himself has espoused virulently anti-trans and right-wing uh, worldviews, um, Bob Parsons of uh, GoDaddy, and Peter Thiel, who has a unique um, position in this, in this conversation about psychedelics and commercialization. It should be said that all billionaires are effectively authoritarians in the sense that they maintain a system of vast wealth and inequality that they benefit from. So Peter Thiel is a patron of both psychedelics and the far right. He has he led an investment round and has a, a stake of $12 million in the Thai Life Sciences, was an early investor in Compass, and also has a company called Palantir, which could be called a digitally uh, empowered fascism uh, by researchers who have looked at this work. Palantir is a data aggregate, aggregation surveillance firm, and Peter Thiel likes to name his companies after Lord of the Rings references. And yes, this is a Palantir. So Peter Thiel has written for the Cato Institute that he finds that democracy and liberty, as he understands it, are incompatible. In the same essay, he laments women's suffrage. And BuzzFeed reported that he had made, made overtures to white nationalists while supporting Donald Trump. And in his, in his work uh, where he broke company with democracy, uh, he explicitly pointed to Mencius Moldbug, the reactionary author, Yarvin, who also was the head of a software company that Peter Thiel funded. Moldbug called Thiel privately in emails to Milo Yiannopoulos of, of Breitbart as uh, fully enlightened, uh, politically speaking. So yeah, so this, um, this is Jonathan Lubecki, a MAPS employee who introduced himself to me and others as a conservative whis whisperer. He is a lobbyist for MAPS. And this is his public story. 
And this kind of lobbying is uh, a kind of real politic to, to further uh, psych psychedelic medicalization by appealing to narratives about veterans and, and PTSD and has facilitated political connections between uh, MAPS and psychedelic reformers and far-right characters, including the Mercer family, who are acknowledged by a Republican insider as being the chief international funders of white nationalism. Uh, Rebecca Mercer here, shown on one of Rick Doblin's slides. So, um, to be clear, so this is Doblin proudly broadcasting the alliances he's making with far right wing actors. Right. So Re Rebecca Mercer is the founder of Parler and Breitbart. Breitbart is a white nationalist out outlet. Parler was helped help to organize. It was a, a platform for communication among uh, the Capitol rioters. And her father, Robert Mercer, is the founder, uh, along with Steve Bannon of Cambridge Analytica, which used big data tactics to um, get Brexit and uh, Trump elections. To um, manipulate voters to behave in certain ways. So we want to point to uh, a very consistent narrative that Rick Doblin, um, we point to this in the paper for, for decades, Rick Doblin has been advancing systemic change facilitated by psychedelic induced consciousness shifts um, that will have geopolitical world peace objectives by helping radical fundamentalists move to a more mystical orientation. So this, we, we designate this as uh, a sort of ends justify the means tactic where if, if this is what you believe, then working with anyone is worth it to achieve this. We point to cultures of psychedelic authoritarianism within the traditions of psychedelic therapy underground and, uh, and the history of, of psychedelic investigation, which is really adequate, really amazingly put, to get, put together in a podcast collaboration with New York Mag with our colleagues. Dr. Lily K. Ross and Dave Nichols, and we do some commentary on that at Symposia. So for more information, check those out. But there's also you know, a, a history of association of psychedelic use between um, new relig religious movement leaders or Shinrikyo used LSD to induce mystical experiences, what was associated with terroristic violence with sarin gas in the Tokyo sub subway, which injured thousands and killed more than a dozen. The Rajneeshis perpetrated a biological attack to rig an election in Oregon in the 80s. Nick Sands of Orange Sun Sunshine fame, uh, a chemist, lived in Pune and manufactured, according to Tim Scully, massive um, quantities of LSD. Uh, and of course, the Manson. So just to show, maybe we can take this one, or I'll just play it. It's, this is almost the end. So in this one, we Ben Shapiro, who we saw earlier, is talking to Dave Rubin and Jordan Peterson about psychedelic medicalization and really emphasizing how conservatives who previously were not interested in taking psychedelics because they were illegal and they like following laws. Now with medicalization, there's more of an on-ramp and entryway for certain people like Ben Shapiro to, to join, to take psychedelics, for example. The quit smoking, 85% success rate with one mystical experience on psilocybin produces 85% cessation rate in smoking. Three treatments with MDMA, that's what the current research indicates, produces a 72% cure rate for intractable post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm. It's like, those are miracle cures and no one, and they have to be accompanied by the mystical experience. I'm pointing out that there are undeniable realms of human experience that involve a sense of the infinite transcendent that you cannot deny. And I've done a lot of those things that you just mentioned and virtually always had good experiences on them. Now, as someone that I'm pretty sure has never smoked weed, no, I've never you haven't eaten yet. mushrooms, you haven't, no, okay, you haven't done MDMA I, yeah, and, and barely, all that stuff. I barely will take a drink. I did them in college. I had a couple of those type of transcendent feeling. I was just part of something, whatever. But So when you hear all this, mm -hmm. as someone that doesn't partake in any of this, what do you make of, of that? That people can perhaps use some substances that you're not down mm -hmm. with on a personal level to get to a place that I think you actually think is a good place. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the answer is that it depends on you know, the level of expertise of the person using it is what I would suggest, you know, the idea, like I'm not against prescription medication. So if you're mm -hmm. talking about, you know, an actual program that's gonna better somebody's life, right. that's one thing. But if it's somebody who's just, I wanna have a religious experience, let me pop some LSD. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Then there, there's some serious downsides to drugs that. So more, more conservatives are going to be taking. It was hands down the single most meaningful and important and life enriching thing I've ever done in my whole life, full stop, nothing really comes close. And actually for two years I was looking around, are there any companies I can invest in? There weren't, and then I did it myself.
So what's that like when you're like, all right, I'm gonna be the magic mushroom guy. And I should tell you, I, I've done magic mushrooms many times and I've always loved doing it. But sort of what I think is interesting about you also is that you're, you're basically, but I don't wanna put words in your mouth, you're basically politically a conservative. And I think it's kind of, there's like this dichotomy between, wait a minute, he's a conservative, but also he's the magic mushroom guy. I sort of say that's what the new sort of conservative thing is. So can you talk a little bit about that and then how you went ahead and said, okay, we're gonna make this into a business. We have to create a world where we all have a place. How do psychedelics come into it? By the way, most religions are based on psychedelics. You feel connected to nature and other humans. A lot of people feel disconnected from everything. And I think we need that spirituality back in our world. And my view is of religion is like, Whatever you believe, it's definitely healthy for you. I forgot to mention that's Christian Angermeyer, who's behind the, the, the Thai Life, Life Sciences. Sciences. CEO. And so, so I don't, just one thing that I wanted to mention. So we we've been in communication with Douglas Rushkoff, who was involved in early psychedelic work, also early internet stuff, and, he, and we've been talking about the fact that in the early internet, a lot of the exuberance about how the internet was democratizing and connecting everyone around the planet. The, there was a naivete to that that allowed for this corporate takeover to happen and didn't need to play out the way it is where there's big corporations running the internet. So I would like to posit that we're in a similar moment with psychedelics where we have the opportunity to build a psychedelic system of, you know, a, a discipline, a field and evidence-based science and, and, and reaching out to different kinds of communities, indigenous groups, underrepresented people and build a kind of psychedelic medicine that works for everyone but it's not going to happen all, all by itself. Right. So the idea here is that, you know, interdisciplinary perspectives that take seriously the things that uh, people say and compare them to the, the beliefs and, and actions that they take in the marketplace have things to contribute to the psychedelic discourse towards making a, a more democratic and inclusive post-prohibitionary world. Just to re-emphasize belief shifts with psychedelics do in fact happen, but we don't have evidence that they do so in a consistent manner, or at least not great evidence. And ultimately, these the idea that individual solutions are going to um, be a replacement for material systemic change, for example, action on climate change, is, is something that is already widely critiqued in uh, the humanities. And also, as mainstreaming proceeds, in the American context, in the existing sphere of, of belief, as we saw with Jen, ben, ben Shapiro, acknowledging that institutional sanctioning of psychedelic medicine would in fact change his, minds on, his mind on psychedelics. We point to the discourse on psychedelic chaplaincy um, to, to simply state that it, it is very likely that we will see some sort of psychedelic prosperity gospel megachurch emerging in the United States. Thank you to everyone for bearing with us through a very long presentation. These are folks that we'd like to thank and are affiliated with, and except for the school year, but the others we're affiliated with. And we'd just like to really encourage people. So 10 years ago, I helped organize the first university-sponsored academic conference in psychedelics at the University of Pennsylvania, sponsored by UPenn, Ivy League Medical School. And 10 years later, we're bringing psychedemia back for the first time since then at OSU, really emphasizing on a democratic, all career stage, all disciplines are respected and, and really appreciated and kind of coming together for an evidence-based conversation about how we can move psychedelics forward in a way that is supportive of society at large. So psychedemiaconference.org, we encourage you to share with people you know and to submit uh, an abstract by uh. May 6th. So yeah, and to be clear, this is in partnership with the Center for Psychedelic Drug Research and uh, Education at The Ohio State University. Which is a newly launched center there. Yeah. So thank you for your patience and attention. We're happy to take questions, both in present and from Zoom. Thank you. That was fascinating. Thank you. And it's, you made a very powerful case that psychedelics can be used for good or ill. Uh, that's raised the question of sort of those questions of the mystical experience, the transcendent experience, the loss of sense of self, 
do you want to weigh in whether that is a good or a bad thing that happens? So the question is related to the, just repeating for the online folks, mystical experience and the eco dissolution and the loss of the sense of self and whether that's good or bad, is it inherently, yeah. inherently good or bad? I mean, I think there, there, there could be an, an argument for these kinds of experiences being, you know, enhancing to well-being. I, I would also say, though, that just looking at what happens when you speak to somebody who's been non-consensually dosed at a high level, and they will not talk about that experience as have, having been beneficial. So as with many of the things that we referred to in this talk, context matters quite a bit, set and setting. I think that there is a lot of evidence that there's a therapeutic, there can be a therapeutic benefit in your sense of self as an isolated, anxious individual going away and feeling empathy and concern for others around you, that that can lead to more awareness of our reliance on each other and the nature of systemic problems, that the importance of solidarity and organizing for social change, but that that's a latent potential that comes out of an experience like ego dissolution that needs to be cultivated. And there's other ways of cultivating ego dissolution that are harmful and antisocial. To be clear, uh, we should expect competing visions for how that um, should be managed and contextualized. Well, thanks so much for all these. I think the highest praise I can use in academic concept of challenges. My, my question is related to the image that you've got up here and, and uh, final bullet point you put, you know, that solving solutions at the individual level doesn't precipitate systemic change or address systemic problems. And, and I think that's fair, but my question is for that young koala in this image who's in a deforested area, is it fair to offer nothing and inherently negative to try and address individual problems in parallel with society? Yeah, I, I would say addressing the koala is very real because the question is, is it ethical to treat the koala even though there are these systemic issues causing the anxiety or the harm to the individual koala in this image. And I would say it's absolutely important to approach these problems from all directions. I think that the issue is some of the, the corporate delic actors are focusing exclusively on the individualist, individualistic solution. Because things like resilience can help people be better organizers and have the capacity to protest and kind of agitate for change in a productive way. But when that becomes the focus at the expense of the environmental pollution that we are all in, or in the case of Christian Angermeyer, who says the world is just getting bad for, for human brains. Oh, well, maybe we should pro, you know, push back on that narrative. It's like, why are we kind of going along with that? But I do agree that approaching it from both sides simultaneously seems like a good way to go. I, I would just also like to point out, and not to be pedantic, but in this particular image, we're dealing with a koala who's uh, source of food has been cut down. Koalas only um, eat eucalyptus leaves. So the only solution for this koala is, in fact, more eucalyptus leaves. So maybe from the Zoom participants. There's one question in the chat. Vincent said, fantastic talk. Would you uh, agree should, that? Should I read it here? Yeah, you okay. got it. Thank so you. The question says, fantastic talk. Would you agree that many right-wing groups are predatory in the sense that they utilize the cognitive opening as an opportunity to recruit prospective group members? So I don't have the kind of data that could adequately answer that question. And I, I think that you know, in terms of characterizing one's political opponents as predatory, I'm not sure how helpful it is. But I, I would say you know, that there are recruitment tactics that are well known on the right that capitalize on particularly young men's dismay, the disconnect between a world. It's literally a right-wing meme. This is what was stolen from you. This is the pointing to an ideal, idealized golden age of, of patriarchal worship that is not available to these young men. And so that cognitive dissonance, yes, that to that degree it is exploited as a recruitment. So yeah, some questions. You mentioned that Jordan Peterson cherry picks natural metaphor like lobsters and hierarchy. Are you aware of any ecological phenomenon that, that doesn't display a hierarchy. Okay, so thank you for allowing me to flex some of my evolutionary ecology chops. I'll do my best to, to answer this. You know, there are, there are a number of organisms that are clonal that you know don't organize themselves in discernible hierarchical means. Interdependence, redundancy, these kinds of uh, things are are 
uh, uh, strewn about in broad patterns across nature. There are feedback loops of, of interdependence that we can see in uh, cell replication or in gene uh, replication. And all of these display multiple uh, mechanisms of, of control and interaction and simplifying everything to, to a hierarchical um, relationship not only doesn't comport with the evidence uh, of the vast diversity of organizational principles across species and at multiple levels of organization and life systems, but it's also kind of sad and boring to view the world through that lens. Well, it's also, the, the, Jordan Peterson uses a straw man argument where he says, if you get rid of hierarchy, then there's no way to discern competency from incompetence. And I would fundamentally challenge that idea that through evidence-based assessment of situations, you can tell if someone's a good surgeon. You're not saying, he has this idea of equality of outcome that any old person can pick up a knife on the street and suddenly start doing surgery, but that is not hierarchy and evidence-based assessment of competency are not the same thing. I would also just sort of come back and, and try and point to a specific answer to, to answer it as a counterpoint to the kind of examples that Jordan Peterson uses, you know, citing the work of, for example, Jane Goodall, who spent her career observing primates. She said that no, no chimpanzee is dominant in all situations, that older chimpanzees with more, you know, wisdom and experience were deferred to in complicated uh, situations of novelty, whereas stronger or younger or more vigorous chimpanzees were diverted to when those traits were necessary. So in, just relying on, on, on that example, we see ways in which the dominance hierarchy is not a you know, universal narrative. And also on the right wing, the, the, you know, the con concept of, of being an alpha taken from a you know, study of, of wolves, that research was based on wolves in captivities in captivity, and, and the author of that research has, has repudiated the, the sort of misuse of that, of that worldview. That's not how wolves behave when they are not in cages. Oh, I believe you reduced Peter Thiel quite a bit. I'm not sure what that means. Um, the far right and LGBT community are typically opposed. Perhaps, okay, perhaps yeah. it's important to mention that Peter Thiel is one of the only billionaires that is gay and married to a man. So we should okay. note that when we showed um, Angermeyer and yeah. Ruben, right. both of those both individuals of them are gay. Are gay. And also, Angermeyer is allegedly a billionaire himself. Um, yeah, he claims to be. So one one thing that's important in the literature on fascism, fascist organizations are happy to kind of temporarily make allegiances with out groups as long as it serves their interests. But over time, as fascist groups gain power, it's a first in, first out historically, yeah. where it's like they will temporarily, like Ben Shapiro is a Jew. You know, mm -hmm. there's a lot of people who, or there's Candace Owens uh, who is black, for Ben example. Shapiro used to be a writer for Breitbart. And according to BuzzFeed, um, emails obtained by BuzzFeed, uh, Breitbart, a commentator, uh, Milo Yiannopoulos uh, coordinated with open white nationalists and neo-Nazis on much of his work. So it, it is fair to say that Breitbart is uh, a white nationalist um, mouthpiece. So just, yeah, and emphasize that just because there are some people on the far right that are mm -hmm. from marginalized groups does not suggest that the far right is hospitable towards and, marginalized and groups. And just to mention, like, and maybe I'm, I'm intentionally warping this, but I, I take Peter Thiel quite seriously, and I don't, I don't think I'm reducing him. I'm, I'm watching his actions in the space that I'm concerned about. And then there's another question. Is there any studies looking at baseline beliefs? Right-wing authoritarians might be interested in psychedelics, but do they actually change? I know multiple people who were right-wing involved in psychedelics, but generally just became more conspiratorial. Bob Altemeyer suggests openness is a core element of right-wing authoritarians, which psychedelics are theorized to change. At the same time, I could see some drugs like MDMA boosting oxytocin tied to in-group bonding, making people more right-wing. There was one N equals one study that we cited yeah. in the paper yeah. where there was a, a white supremacist. Or it was a part of an MDMA trial, and they, they actually had been recently subjected to online doxing, meaning their identity had been revealed and connected to their white national or white supremacist organizing by an anti-fascist. By an anti-fascist, and this caused him distress. And during his MDMA experience, he did call into question his white nationalist beliefs. However, after a couple of, after a follow-up, he, he reverted to these beliefs. And there's one more question here. Considering your overall argument, would it be safe to say that you're in agreement with Ido Hardegzone's theory of cultural set and setting? 
In other words, the meaning enhancing properties of psychedelics like psilocybin simply put enhance or amplify the cultural set and setting these substances are consumed in. I think it's fair to say, and we, I, I, we uh, cite him. I'm citing uh, Hardik's son and, um, and actually op open up opened up, I opened up Lucy in the Sky with Nazis with an assertion that writ large, the cultural set and setting of the psychedelic Renaissance is actually capitalism. And so, yeah, so the idea of the cultural set and setting is that there, the, the cultural constructs that we live under encourage and suppress the possibility of, of individual set and setting. So it's like, our, our larger point with critiquing capitalist kind of takeover of psychedelics or the attempt to is that the possibility of gaining insight into systemic change is actually decreased when you're surrounded by neoliberal capitalist trained therapists who are emphasizing certain kinds of interpretations over others. So the, the, it's not a neutral, the, the way that we scale matters for the kinds of experiences that we're encouraging. And I would just point to how many of the, the players in the psychedelic renaissance hail from Sil Silicon Valley and come from personal extreme experiences of ego dissolution and mystical experience. And then very shortly after, in many cases, their first um, thought is to operationalize this as an app or a startup, all of which is, is a reflection of the larger pressures and reward systems in society. So I would argue that from your excellent presentation that we have people on the left, people on the right that are uh, taking psychedelics and feeling that in general, they are a positive effect on their behavior, their life. We're also finding, as uh, you've alluded to, some really strong evidence that there is a therapeutic benefit in the proper administration of these under controlled settings. So it's not really clear to me what the takeaway is. You've given us a, war a, a warning shot that what we see as perhaps a promotion of psychedelics in greater use is not so much from the liberals, but also that there may be a conservative intent there. Is this an argument that we should not that, that we should resist the commercialization or the recreationalization of psychedelics and we should be more firm in keeping this a, a restricted medical use? So the question for those online relates to, given the concerns that we raised, does that make an argument against the medicalization of psychedelics or recreational rec the de <laughs> decriminalization <laughs> recreational use but but the preservation mm -hmm. only of controlled medical um, right. use is that correct okay. correct so in a paper i have coming out in a bit i do an analysis of uh, michael pollan in the in the new york times was really advocating for highly hierarchical modes of access in the west so whether it's churches, and he only lists syncretic mm. Christianity-aligned churches, or spas for the elites, mm -hmm. or the third one is no, medicalization, clinics. No, yeah, clinics. Mm. So I would personally advocate for preventing hierarchical approaches to psychedelic access from being the only mode of access that people are allowed to have access to. Yeah. I think it also is really important to think strategically about what medicalization looks like, because if we have authoritarian leaning guides or, 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 or sitters Facilitators. who are friends with powerful people and have been kind of allowed to maintain their power over vulnerable people who are coming to them, some people in the medicalization side of things say, we need to not cause any undue attention to this. We need to be we focused need to be on the goal. We need to be ap apolitical, and our position is that it matters if you're if you're putting authoritarian type people in a room with 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 vulnerable populations, and that we need to be really careful about is the therapist there to actually support the person's experience, or are they there because they have some unresolved need for power? And we've seen this across the board with when you have vulnerable people with access to, you know, whether it's the church or gymnasts, in the case of, of Larry, Nassar, Larry Nassar, when you're creating a, a pool of vulnerable people and you're giving people a lot of power, it's really important to vet who it is that's in the room with them. So we would suggest that it's important to not have medicalization be the only route of access and to be very slow and intentional and include a lot of oversight 
and training and not rush to the end point because we think that's going to change the world and fix things quickly. Yeah. Oh, excuse me. I was going to say, but if you don't mind, why is it important to Move forward more into Okay, so first of all, I would say like, yeah, um, the question was, if we don't medicalize it, wouldn't that move move things more towards a, a direction that we're trying to avoid, having access to power over others? Okay, so, I mean, power dynamics exist, and much of what we put together on the table here is actually describing dynamics that are in play. In many ways, we're doing the best that we can to, yes, we have, you know, political positions and things that we're quite open about in terms of positions, of how we would like things to go in psychedelic medical or psychedelic um, the renaissance and, and resurgence. But in this paper, we're describing what, what we see, right? Um, with, with regard to this idea that there is only only the pathway um, that is gatekept by uh, medical authorities or church authorities. Both of those uh, are hierarchical organizations um, with very specific barriers to, to entry. Personally, I believe that the mystical experience is a deeply human um, experience that should be available to anyone who seeks it, whether by means of psychedelics or otherwise. And I'm, I'm, I'm quite skeptical of those um, who seem to be positioning themselves as gatekeepers and, and perhaps also for profit. In the United States, we have a profit medical system, and I would not be able to afford psychedelic therapy if this was available today. I am an un, un, uninsured contingent academic. So in some ways, we're talking about things that affect us personally and people that we know who are vulnerable. I would also point out that like with regard to PTSD and the, the, the argument for medicalization, the treatment of trauma, that particular syndrome is not equally distributed. It's much higher in prevalence with women and with marginalized community and communities and racialized communities. And so if your goal is to treat that, that should inform uh, your approach. And another point along those lines is at Symposia, we, we are firm believers in decriminalization. We don't think that people should be arrested for using drugs. But along with decriminalization, we advocate for what we refer to as ideological harm reduction. And there are ways to help educate communities about, for example, dark triad personality types, like what are the red flags to look out for? Because oftentimes people, like with Harvey Weinstein, who had the, the, a lot of sexual abuse around Hollywood, a lot of people after that came out, said we didn't know he was sexually abusing people, but we knew he was a bully. Mm -hmm. And it's the same willingness to trespass boundaries that extends into a willingness to sexually abuse. And our culture right now is very tolerant of bullies and allows bullies to rise to the top and have positions of power. So along with democratizing access, we need to democratize access to information about community safety. And also I would argue giving people the opportunity to have psychedelic experiences with people they love and who love them and have relationship with them and building relationships through these types of experiences will allow for you know certain kinds of closeness and understanding that when an you're experience to build within communities and 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 even toward building solidarity with communities so there's certain kinds of problems with medicalization traveling far away to trip with a stranger who you don't know who maybe got to their position as a guide because they were really good at winding their way up a, a power hierarchy based on bullying or whatever else, but there are other ways of building resilient communities that should go along with access. To that, I would point to a, an old motto within anti-fascist organizing groups, and that is, we keep us safe. And so building that uh, local knowledge and ability um, to to act from a place of, of care and, and mutual aid and development, that, that, that's something we would advocate for. And, and one last point, that speaks to as well as some of the work that we do with Symposia, where we do occasionally name names when there are bad actors. And the reason that we do that is to give people the information they need to make consensual choices around engaging with problematic actors. Any other question? Yeah, so going back to sort of the, the strong man argument that you were refuting, that you know, the man on the street is not as qualified to wield a scalpel of a surgeon, and the way that we assess that is through um, evidence based outcomes assessments, right? And so, in, in a world where we have you know, medicalization access, you're describing this as a, a hierarchy, right? That's presumably evidence based access, that's, that's one thing. If you have a parallel world, 
uh, where we also have access outside of the natural context, what, what would you suggest as, as evidence-based criteria for the community to access outside of that hierarchy? Like okay. if, they, if they agree that evidence-based methods are, are I think I have a simple answer. Yeah. So I think the, the question is relating to, you know, if we have medical access and community access, what criteria do we have to ensure that people have, you know, evidence-based protocols in both spaces? Okay. So first of all, Nishe, Dr. Devineau, and, um, and I are both educators in psychedelic studies and we advocate for a science and evidence-based curriculum around drug education, starting when people use drugs, which is pretty early. So that is one, one way of addressing things at the, at the community level. In some ways, we could uh, compare this to education around sex, much of which, by the way, was led by marginalized and queer communities. I, in terms of like uh, the, the distrust of how you know, communities might manage psychedelics, some of which is, is well-founded, and we can point to examples of, of that not, not being healthy and things going wrong. With regard to psychedelic medicalization, this is not the first time that medical authority has been um, applied to use psychedelics to change people's consciousness. And in fact, it will be multiple decades, hopefully, of, of good um, healing work on, behalf, uh, on behalf of, of physicians using psychedelics as, as medicines to hopefully atone for some of the things that were done during the MK Ultra era. So I guess my first point is that there's also a lot of uh, harm reduction literature that can be drawn from places like Amsterdam, the Netherlands, and from Uruguay in developing criteria that they're going to sort of operationalize or decriminalize space and also medicalize space. So I think they find those data points probably wouldn't be terribly difficult. My, my thought, though, is sort of pivoting a little bit, and I wonder if you could share some ideas around psychedelic studies, what your vision for psychedelic studies as a field is. One thing that we have thought lots about here is the value of transdisciplinarity, and as opposed to interdisciplinarity. So what actually grows out of these fields and different scholars working together to create new ideas. And so I'm just, if you can maybe just share a little bit about how psychedelic studies fits in. Yeah, so the question was about how to develop psychedelic studies as a field in a way that is truly transdisciplinary and brings different disciplinary insights together rather than keeping disciplines siloed. How right? to operationalize that yeah. and also what is it to incorporate data points from international models where psychedelics have either been decriminalized or not not fully criminalized. Mm -hmm. Just yeah. You know, I was talking to Cody earlier today about some recent research that I've been involved with with Johns Hopkins where I as a comparative literature PhD was working with a student of mine, a bioethics student, and now an anthropology PhD and another anthropologist to analyze Johns Hopkins's the narrative reports that were generated out of their first smoking cessation study. And we cross correlated the experiences with the materials, the, the study protocol and we, we, we discovered that there were parallels in the ways that people were describing their experiences based on the unpublished and mostly unseen study protocols and brought them into conversation. So what we were discussing earlier today is I would love to see a expansion of the kinds of research that are done, that is done. Because you could have, you know, the standard pharmacology research or psychiatry research that's focused on quantitative outcomes, but then you bring in disciplines like history and anthropology, gender studies, looking at power relationships, and you're analyzing what is the package, including the art in the room, including the expectancies generated by, and this is, relates to Muthu Kumaraswamy et al.'s work, really advocating for bringing this material more into the open. Because once you start creating a new publishing paradigm where we're not just trying to publish data to get over the finish line as quick as possible, but we're showing how we're getting that data and providing the context to meaningfully interpret that data, suddenly we can ask questions about what are we telling people ahead of time? What are their expectations going into it? How much is their experience tied to the way that we're creating their and crafting their set and setting? So as soon as there's this been, been this call to turn towards set and setting, 
suddenly need the expertise of people in other disciplines, in the humanities, the social sciences, in a way that can only happen once we get to a place where those disciplines are respected as much as the sciences. Because I have been working in this field since 2010, and I am half Indigenous, and I have been doing this work for a long time in a lot of different ways. And the reason why I'm not more widely known is because I have dealt with the kinds of personality types that have not liked my work and have sought to marginalize me. And I'm using this not to paint myself as some kind of victim, but just to, I think it's a case study in how the bullying dynamics that are tolerated in this field are holding the field back and how we need to respect the humanities and other disciplines in order to actually gain the expertise in a meaningful way and advance the narratives that we're using to talk about psychedelics. The one thing I have to add to that excellent um, answer to your question is that I teach Dr. Devineau's uh, essay, a declaration uh, of psychedelic studies that she wrote 12 years ago as the very first thing that my students in my psychedelic studies class teaches. And she has a lot to contribute to this field and has already contributed a lot to this field. And just to emphasize, it's really not about me. I just cite my example because it's very apparent to me but this happens across the board. And there are brilliant people who are not here and who are not talking with us and having these conversations today because they have been forced out and made to feel unwelcome here and underappreciated. So we need to get past the hierarchies of academia to be able to respect all career levels and all disciplines in order to get to the field that I think will ultimately be the more exciting research is yet to come. Thank you. For <laughs>